Okay, so we're going to go over photosynthesis, and this actually covers section 8.2 8 and 8.3 from the book. I combined the two into this um, lecture. Okay, so looking at, um, we need to talk about light when we're going to talk about photosynthesis. Um, energy from the sun travels to the earth in the form of light. Sunlight is a mixture of different wavelengths, many of which are visible um, to our eyes and make up the visible spectrum. So we can see the visual, visible spectrum wavelengths, but not like ultraviolet or x-ray um, radio waves. We can't see those. We can only see the visible spectrum, which are the colors. Um, our eyes see different wavelengths of the visible spectrum as different colors. So here, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Um, plants gather the sun's energy with light absorbing molecules called pigments. So the plant's principal pigment is chlorophyll. Um, so there's two types of chlorophyll found in plants, chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. And they absorb light very well in the blue-violet spectrum. So here in the blue-violet area, you can see peaks of um, optimum weight of absorption for chlorophyll A and B. And then they um, also absorb stuff, um, energy in the kind of reddish visible spectrum. Um, but they don't absorb in the green area of the visible spectrum. So that's actually because why leaves and plants look green is that they're actually reflecting the green wavelength. They don't absorb it, they reflect it. So the colors you see are wavelengths that are being reflected back to your eye. The colors you don't see are being absorbed by that object. Most of the time the green color of the chlorophyll overwhelms the other pigments, but as temperatures drop, like in the fall, chlorophyll molecules break down and red and orange pigments um, actually um, start to show that are always present um, and they can be seen now, and these are called carotenoid pigments, so things like carrots are kind of orange. Um, looking at the graph below, um, showing what wavelengths of light photosynthetic pigments absorb energy, we can see that, again, plant pigments absorb light the best in the blue spectrum of light. That was talked about in the previous slide. Um, the organelles um, in plants that are responsible for photosynthesis are chloroplasts. Um, these contain sac-like photosynthetic membranes called thylakoids. So this one little stack here is a thylakoid. And when you stack them together, um, each individual stack is called a granum, or if you look at all these stacks, it would be grana. Chlorophyll pigments are located in the thylakoid membranes. And the fluid portion outside the thylakoids that are within the chloroplast, so the spaces between the thylakoids, are known as stroma. So we're going to see that different parts of photosynthesis take place in the thylakoid, and the stroma. <laughs> All right, looking at energy collection, because light is a form of energy, any compound that absorbs light absorbs energy. Chlorophyll absorbs visible light especially well. So when chlorophyll absorbs light, a large fraction of that light of the light energy is transferred to electrons. These high energy electrons make photosynthesis work. So we're going to take a look at that right now. Okay, so the high energy electrons produced by chlorophyll are highly reactive and require a special carrier. So think of a high energy electron as being similar to a hot potato. Um, if you wanted to move the potato from one place to another, you would use an oven mitt, also we would refer to it as like a carrier, to transport it. Um, so here an example of an electron carrier would be NADP. Um, it'll combine with electrons and hydrogen and become NADPH right here. Um, plants use electron carriers to transport high energy electrons from chlorophyll to other molecules. So going from one area, moving it to another area, um, these electron carriers help do that. So again, NADP um, is an electron carrier molecule. Um, NADP accepts and holds two high energy electrons along with hydrogen. Um, in this way, it will be converted to NADPH. The NADPH can then carry the high energy electrons to chemical reactions elsewhere in the cell. So in order to overview photosynthesis, you may have seen this in previous science classes, um, but again, photosynthesis uses the energy of sunlight to convert water and carbon dioxide into high energy sugars and oxygen. So here's the reaction. Six molecules of carbon dioxide react with six molecules of water. So these are your two reactants. And your two products are um, a molecule of glucose and six molecules of oxygen. Um, so that is what I said here with the words. So you do need light energy in order for this reaction to happen. 
Um, so plants use the sugars generated by photosynthesis to produce complex carbohydrates, such as starches, and to provide energy for the synthesis of other compounds, including proteins and lipids. So um, again, plants are autotrophs. They make their own food or like their own carbohydrates. Okay, so there's two types of reactions that happen in photosynthesis. The first type is called a light dependent reaction. Um, they're called light dependent because they require the direct involvement of light and light absorbing pigment. So they depend on light. You need light in order for the light dependent reactions to happen. The light dependent reactions use energy from sunlight to produce ATP, the energy molecule, and NADPH, the electron um, carrier that, that accepts electrons. These reactions take place within the thylakoid membranes of the chloroplast. So they're inside um, the thylakoid membrane here. Um, right, like through here, right? Here's the membrane. Water is required as a source of electrons and hydrogen ions. So there's the water as a reactant in uh, photosynthesis. And then oxygen is released as a byproduct, which is oxygen is one of the products of photosynthesis. So thylakoids contain, so to kind of go over more of this system here, um, thylakoids, contain, thylakoids contain clusters of chlorophyll um, and proteins known as photosystems. Photosystems absorb sunlight and generate high energy electrons that are then passed to a series of electron carriers embedded in the thylakoid membrane. So the, the actual first photosystem involved here is that it sounds kind of weird, but it's photosystem two. Um, light energy is absorbed by the electrons in the pigments within photosystem two, increasing the electron's energy level. The high energy electrons are then passed to the electron transport chain, a series of electron carriers that shuttle high energy electrons during ATP generating reactions. So we're gonna be using the, elect um, the energy from the electrons and um, the, the cell will house that to make ATP. Energy from the electrons is used by proteins in the electron transport chain to pump hydrogen ions from the stroma into the thylakoid space. So here, hydrogens will be pumped into the thylakoid space. At the end of the electron transport chain, the electrons pass to the photosystem one, which is this one right here. Because some energy has been used to pump hydrogen ions across the thylakoid membrane, electrons do not contain as much energy as they used to when they reach photosystem one. So pigments in photosystem one use energy from light to re-energize the electrons. At the end of a short second um, electron transport chain, ADP, the carry, electron carrier molecules in the stroma pick up the high energy electrons and hydrogen ions at the outer surface of the thylakoid membrane to become NADPH. Um, so the hydrogen ion accumulate within the thylakoid space from the splitting of water and from being pumped from in the stroma. The buildup of the hydrogen ions makes the stroma negatively charged, so a negatively charged relative to the space within the thylakoid right here. This gradient, the difference in both the charge of hydrogen ion concentration across the membrane, provides the energy to make up ATP or to make ATP. So think of like a dam holding a bunch of water back. Um, you can use that water um, as a source of energy. So same thing here, this like gradient of really negative charge to not so negative charge can be, you can house that energy to make ATP. Um, so the light dependent reactions produce oxygen gas and convert ADP and NADP into the energy that carries ATP and NADPH. ATP and NADPH provide the energy needed to build high energy sugars like glucose from low energy carbon dioxide. So the light independent reactions um, plants absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and complete the process of photosynthesis by producing sugars and other carbohydrates. During light independent reactions, which you don't need direct sunlight for that um, to, in order for this reaction to happen, ATP and NADPH molecules produced in the light dependent reactions are now used to produce high energy sugars from carbo, carbon dioxide. So no light again is required to power the light independent reaction. So they're independent of the light. So light independent reactions take place outside the thylakoid. Um, so not in the thylakoid here, they are now in the stroma, the spaces within the chloroplast. Okay, so in this um, light independent reaction, we have something called the Kelvin cycle, which uses six molecules of carbon dioxide. So the six uh, molecules of carbon dioxide, that's a reactant for uh, photosynthesis. 
the, uh, we use the six carbon dioxide molecules to produce the single one six carbon sugar molecule, like the, which is glucose, which is a high energy sugar. This occurs again in the stroma of the chloroplast. The energy for the reactions is supplied by the compounds produced in the light dependent reactions. So the plant uses the sugars produced by the Calvin cycle to meet um, its energy needs and to build macromolecules needed for growth and development. When other organisms eat plants, they can use the energy and raw material stored in these compounds. So the end results here, the two sets of photosynthetic reactions work together. The light dependent reactions trap the energy of the sunlight into chemical form, and the light independent reactions actually use the chemical energy to produce stable, high energy sugars from carbon dioxide and water. In, this, in the process, animals, including humans, get food and an atmosphere filled with oxygen. Um, factors that affect photosynthesis um, would include temperature, light, and water. So, for example, the reactions of photosynthesis are made possible by enzymes that function best between the temperatures 0 and 35 degrees Celsius. So temperatures above or below this range may affect those enzymes, therefore slowing down the rate of photosynthesis or stopping it entirely. Um, looking at light intensity, high light intensity, obviously the more light you have, you should see a rate of um, photosynthesis synthesis increase. However, after the light intensity reaches a certain level, the plant reaches a maximum rate of photosynthesis as seen in the graph. So for example, for a shade plant, once you reach about like a 14% um, or a light intensity of like, um, what, let's say about um, between 400, 600, um, you level off at about a 14% rate of photosynthesis. For sun plants, a little higher. But once you reach past this like 400 level, um, after that point, it starts to level off. It can't really increase its rate of photo photosynthesis anymore. It can only handle so much light. Um, because water is one of the raw materials in photosynthesis, a shortage of water therefore can slow or even stop photosynthesis because um, it's used as a electron donator. So water loss can also damage plant tissues. Um, plants that live in dry conditions often have waxy coatings on their leaves to reduce water loss to kind of um, avoid losing too much water. Um, they may also have biochemical adaptations that make pho photosynthesis more efficient under dry conditions. Okay, so again, there's a lot of info there. Um, if you need to re rewind or watch anything, again, please do so. Um, but the Ed Puzzle questions will kind of lead you into the key points. And I, I put things in red that were kind of more, um, the more important parts of the lecture. So if there were some details that were a little more confusing that were not in red, um, they were um, good things to know, but not like the most important things for the lecture. So just to give you a heads up. Okay, thanks.